for your biography uh, before you start, okay. start. So I found actually a nice one from Select Biosciences. And uh, Dr. Theodor uh, Alexandrov uh, got, received his, his PhD degree in mathematics in Russia in 2007, did his postdoc at the University of Bremen, Germany, where he became a group leader at the Center for Industrial Mathematics and the head of MALDI Imaging Lab. Since 2010, he's a visiting researcher at the University of California, San Diego. In 2012, he co-founded the company SCILS, where he serves as the scientific director. Since 2014, he's a team leader at European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg with a research program on spatial metabolomics, for which we will hear more details today. And his team develops novel tools of computational biology that reveals spatial organization of metabolic processes by exploiting high throughput metabolic imaging and by translating the generated big data into biological knowledge. And without further ado, we will turn to Dr. Alexander. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Ahmed, for introducing but, and wrong uh, uh, both of you for actually organizing this seminar because I was, I was really amazed how many, how many people which I, uh, who, who science I admire and uh, I'm actually like in some sense trying to focus on this new field spatial omics are uh, represented in this seminar series. Really, really impressive. And at the same time, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to, uh, to contribute to this very exciting field because you know, like you, almost anyone you talk to in omics, they're like, okay, so can we do it spatial, right? So, and, um, and there's definitely a new frontier. Um, so what, my name is Theodore, uh, uh, as introduced, and uh, at EMBL or EMBL, I, I serve as um, team leader with a research program on spatial now single cell metabolomics, but I also serve as a metabolomics core facility, the head of metabolomics core facility. So I know like actually both worlds, not only, you know, spatial or single cell advanced, but also uh, uh, bulk metabolomics, you know, the things which really work. So, and, um, and there we developed methods and I'll introduce some of the methods. Um, and on top of this, I'm assistant adjunct professor at a school of pharmacy at UCSD. And um, I, I started there initially as Swiss in research and it was completely a transformational experience for me to, to really learn the omics and uh, collaborate with a uh, with great scientists, great people, and uh, and now we kind of like pursue in this direction. So, and without further ado, I will start my talk, and which will be on spatial metabolomics. Actually, a lot of methods for spatial metabolomics, and how it can be performed in tissues, and uh, also is in single cells. And as I said, uh, we are mainly method developers lab, and uh, currently um, we are about 15 people uh, with a strong focus on staff scientists because for method development it's, it's very complex and we combine um, uh, scientists and experts not only from biology or omics or chemistry and physical chemistry but also software engineers and computer scientists because a lot of things that we do they require special custom software or sometimes when software turns out to be good we actually share the software with others and I'll present you our main project in this direction. So uh, we've been studying uh, spatial metabolomics or developing tools for spatial metabolomics over the uh, uh, probably last decade and um, over different uh, spatial scales. And um, we studied it, uh, we developed tools for studying on the organismal scale uh, together with uh, Peter Dorstein from UCSD. And we published uh, several papers there and now our tools are used uh, further by the Dorstein lab for, for their uh, analysis. Uh, but since I moved to EMBO six years ago, I, I focused my research initially on tissues, on tissues actions coming from animal models, from resections, but also a little bit on agar plates for microbes, microbiology. But then, um, so in a few years, uh, few, a couple of years later, so out of nowhere, we developed a method for single cell metabolomics. And uh, this, is, uh, this has become our current frontier, but also the main focus of the team to really develop methods not only for tissues, but specifically for single cell metabolomics. And um, we mainly uh, develop methods based on mass spectrometry, which is absolutely awesome technique, very sensitive, um, developing very fast, moving very fast, 
a very broad spectrum. You can detect a lot of different molecules. And also there is a lot of um, uh, progress going on there on the vendor side, but also on in the academia side. And also there is now a lot of startups also coming, coming around this area. And um, we try to develop methods which combine some computational aspects and uh, often computational biology. That means kind of trying to, to get as much as we, we can from computational databases, from approaches, machine learning and so on, but also keeping in mind what's biology behind or what molecules are behind, not just pure computational stuff. And more and more we're getting into the field where AI is necessary for analysis of big data. So um, next I would like to introduce um, our focal point and what we, why actually, first of all, we need spatial and why we need single cell deployment. And, uh, and by now we know very well that cell, and in particular from single cell transcriptomics and other single cell analysis, that every cell is unique, every cell is different, and they differ by a lot of parameters, and uh, definitely they di differ by cell type. But what is more and more recognized and, uh, uh, is the importance of the metabolic cell state of a particular cell. And compared to the cell type, this is actually a very, very plastic state. So they, the cell, they, it's not like in the cell type where they differentiate and only rarely they would de-differentiate. No, this metabolic cell state, it can be affected by a lot of factors. It can be affected by uh, uh, genetic programs. It can be affected by a variety of uh, cellular programs. It also can be affected by, for example, therapy. And here there is definitely a lot of interest currently into studying, for example, metabolic requirements of uh, T cells to really improve the efficacy of, uh, of immunotherapy. And this is just one example, you know, where the importance of understanding or changing very targetedly the metabolic cell state is, is of high value. And on top of this, we definitely know that cells that live uh, in, in interacting with other cells, and even organs which affect them, and organs and further up into in the environment. And this brings all the importance of like really studying this metabolic cell state of being able to have the tools to measure it. So on the, the single cell level, but also in the spatial context. And what's even more interesting now, there is a lot of, um, a lot of research showing that it's not only, you know, metabolism is like end product of the central dogma. No, there is a lot of programs which are regulated by metabolism, including epigenetics and, and further uh, uh, other cellular programs. And this is very interesting because it's not only, again, it's just a readout. No, it's not only like end product, it's really the active player in the cellular programs. That's why it's so important to study it. On top of this, again, it's very dynamic, very plastic. So that's why we need advanced technology. That's why we need to have spatial metabolomics to really study it in situ in the spatial context. I did on the single cell spatial resolution to provide this a very closest to phenotype readout. So for me personally, the two, the two main directions to really have the impact by developing our tools is uh, 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 one is cancer in particular. Here, this is an example of tumor macro environment where not only we know that uh, there are different cell types and also cell subtypes, but also we know that there is a lot of going on in terms of uh, metabolic state. We know that reprogrammed metabolism, increased glycolysis is actually a hallmark of cancer. But on top of this, this creates a very special environment where there is a gradient of pH, acidity, metabolic waste like lactate, nutrients, hypoxia. This really puts the every cell in very special, unique chemical microenvironment. And the second direction where I would really like to have impact with our, with our tools is to really be able to understand the metabolic requirements of immune cells and really, first of all, understand it, but then be able to affect it in such a way so that we'll have much more efficient immunotherapy. It will become not just a black box, but it will be working in, in many more and more cases uh, as a more reliable therapy. So let me now um, uh, ask the question, why now? So why spatial metabolomics is actually, and I'll show you later, is it's, it's a pretty much booming field currently. And uh, what has happened over the past decade? First of all, actually, metabolomics uh, got pushed to a to level from just pure technological research to applications. And here you see a, a screenshot uh, from an editorial from Nature Methods 2011. 
where um, the editor formulated it that um, the focus of metabolomic studies, and again, this is 2011, so the focus of metabolomic studies is shifting from cataloging chemical structures to finding biological stories. And by now we know that metabolomics actually found these biological stories, and there is a lot of uh, interesting research and results uh, which were revealed by metabolomics. But uh, let's now look what's going on on the intersection of metabolomics, spatial metabolomics, and also let's try to put it into a broader perspective of, uh, say, big data and artificial intelligence. So here I'm showing a screenshot of uh, PubMed publications, the numbers. So, and, uh, and if we will go here and, and check uh, how metabolomics was developing, it's, it's basically here, so this purple line. So it's definitely a log logarithmic scale, it's exponential, uh, it's like exponential growth, uh, this in logarithm, shown in logarithmic scale. And what we see that metabolomics is actually, first of all, it's very popular. So uh, compared to, say, here, this would be applications of machine learning in life sciences as indexed by PubMed. So we really see that the, the field of metabolomics and machine learning, they're actually having similar impact in terms of publications in life sciences as in PubMed. So, but what the, and we, if we, if we start like breaking down, what is, what about spatial metabolomics? Then it will see that the main technology for spatial metabolomics, I'll touch upon this later, imaging of spectrometry. So shown here, so it's actually going very fast as compared to, in terms of publications, to the whole field of lipidomics. Or to very recently, it was comparable to the number of publications on deep learning um, in life sciences, which is pretty impressive. But also what we see what happened in 2015, the whole deep learning went completely over uh, 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 through the roof here, which also put a lot of uh, machine learning applications up. But what we're seeing is actually that neither metabolomics nor spatial metabolomics, and if I show you here transcriptomics and genomics, they also, they really didn't really pick up this trend. And, uh, and this is what we're trying to do in our research, really explore uh, how can we use uh, advanced machine learning methods or create platforms so that others can develop it in order to be able to push uh, the spatial omics uh, with the advance of, of machine learning and AI. So let me now focus on another question. So is spatial metabolomics better than bulk? So, and, um, and I mean, and for this seminar, I probably don't need to explain this too much, but I would like to provide my, my viewpoint that actually bulk metabolomics or bulk omics is actually pretty good. So in terms of like detection, quite often it, it is really good. It, it's, it's high molecular coverage. It's normally more confident, easier quantification. So what is actually the key thing that, that we're missing? And what we're missing is really like, uh, uh, not even like, you know, just single cell heterogeneity, it's very abstract, or requirements for number of cells. No, the, the key thing, what we're missing in bulk, and that's why, but you know, spatial actually doesn't get at you for free, we need to work on this. It's really this, to reveal the link from the cell phenotype and all this cell organization of tissues um, to, uh, in, in terms of biological knowledge. And, uh, and again, so I would like to stress that Spatial omics by itself doesn't give it to you for free. You really need to work and develop methods for data interpretation. And this is what we're trying to do. So in the next part of my talk, I'll present um, our research and our methods that we've developed for uh, spatial metabolomics for tissues. So here we use technology on, which is called imaging mass spectrometry. There are different flavors of it. We use uh, one which is called MALDI, a metrics assisted laser desorption ionization, it's laser-based technology. Uh, here you see uh, our scientific officer putting a tissue um, on this glass slide, cover it with a special uh, special layer, um, into uh, open, just open the door, putting it inside, and afterwards laser will shoot at every pixel and will collect this data in the following way that from every pixel there will be a mass spectrum generated. And this mass spectrum is very long, it contains roughly 10,000 of values, which are, you know, spread through the whole mass range, representing a lot of molecules and their intensity and so on. So um, long story short, it generates very high dimensional data. So there are molecules hidden here somehow. So then we do some signal processing, then we generate images corresponding to signals of specific, what we call ions, which is basically molecules ionized so that we can detect them with mass spec. 
And then there is this key step of metabolite identification, which allows us to find really the structures, which are hidden behind these images and say, you know, this image is actually spatial localization of uh, ATP. Oh, that one is actually spatial localization of a lipid, this one of a particular sugar, this one maybe of a hormone, and so on and so forth. So the technology that we have in-house, um, it allows to do uh, analysis with a five to 10 mic micrometer pixel size. This is now the, the best commercially available uh, spatial resolution. It detects uh, more than 100 of molecules in one shot, uh, different classes, small molecules, metabolites, lipids, fatty acids, amino acids, drugs, drug metabolites, and uh, I'll go a bit later. Uh, what's important, it generates a lot of data because it's really untargeted analysis compared to many other, you know, omics where you focus it either based on genome or you based on antibodies. Here, you basically, you detect anything which, which comes into MOSFET and MOSFET is able to detect. A lot, a lot of data is generated. So, and it can be easily generate 100 gigabytes per, per section and even more. So, um, and by now it became image mass spectrometry, in particular multi-image mass spectrometry, became the major technology for, for, for spatial as well. So next I'd like to show you just an example of how the data can look like. Here, this is uh, two biological replicates, uh, one mouse, another mouse. This is a, a section of, uh, of a brain. So a very typical uh, uh, tissue, which is used not only in spatial, say, transcriptomics, but also in spatial microbiomics. So because it's very nice, shows anatomy and very well studied. So, and um, here you see basically the level of signal noise that we're getting, the resolution that we're getting, but you also see that the types of molecules that we can detect and, um, and appreciate that this uh, spans from different molecules, amino acids, modified amino acids, small lipids, some molecules of biological, or really small molecules of biological importance and so on and so forth. Uh, so next I would like to introduce the key challenge that we perceive as really the, the bottleneck or the rate limiting step in, uh, interpret in interpreting this data. So, and we, uh, the signal passing by itself is pretty well established. Visualization as well. So statistical analysis, analysis is definitely more challenging, but there is a bunch of methods and um, including, uh, uh, so some of the developments from academia, but also from, from vendors and other companies. But what comes next, this is, what we subjectively perceive is the real bottleneck. So you get some signals here, you get some values here. I mean, those who are in mass spec will get like MZ mass to charge values. But what molecules are behind this, this is really, really big question. And it was a huge question to recently, and I'll show how we developed a tool to at least partially address it. Because before you can do this, and it again might sound surprising to many of you who are in transcriptomic genomics, but even in proteomics. So, uh, but this is still a big question. And uh, we basically, where proteomics was maybe in the 90s, maybe like early 2000s. So there is still lots, lots of work going on and I would like to show you. So what we do, but first I would like to introduce the challenge, uh, a little bit from the computational perspective. So let's suppose that we have a data set which has a lot of spectra, a lot of images, very big one. So, um, and then on top of this now, what we want, we want to find all the possible small molecules metabolites there. There is a lot of them, definitely many more than 100,000, but let's take it as a ballpark figure. So let's suppose that now we want to, uh, for example, find whether we have glucose in our data set and what is the localization of glucose in tissue. We know everything about this molecule structure, molecular weight, how it's getting ionized by getting a proton, by creating it uh, M, uh, to my mass to charge MZ value that we can search in, in mass spectrometry. So can we just take this value and look at our data and say, this is the, 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 the image? Actually not, because by now we know that uh, the, the, in reality, in mass spec, the, the picture is much more complex. First molecules, they, they get broken into parts, then on top of this, they can get ionized in different ways. And on top of this, there is this thing which is called isotopolux, which is very nature present of, uh, 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 different isotopologs, analogs of molecule with a slightly different molecular weight, which all generates for just one molecule, this can be not other or three, with a uh, tens of different options or images that the molecule can generate. And now we need to really understand which, which of these images is true localization of glucose. So, and even if we can do this, now we need to do it very fast because we want to screen for the whole metabolome for 100,000 plus uh, molecular structures and account for 
this potential, potential ambiguity that this image can come not only from glucose, but it can come also from another molecule because, you know, it's, it's very complex. We have tons of molecules in our tissue. And now we need also to account for a lot of data which is generated by MassPAC, which currently we are not able to be, to, uh, we are not able to assign to molecules. And it's more than 95% of, of amount of data. So what's there? We are really scratching the surface. Every method improves, the, increases this percent from 1% to 2 to 3 to 5 and so on. But there is still at least 95% of data which is not on that data. So to address all the challenge, we have developed um, uh, methods, but then also software called Metaspace. Um, uh, here, this is a publication about the algorithm, and this is uh, our preprint uh, pre uh, presenting the platform. So this is a method and cloud software for metabolite identification for image MSPEC. So by now, in particular with a with a support from a lot of uh, funding from Europe, from uh, the US, from NIH, and also now some partnerships. So uh, it's absolutely free open source platform where anyone can submit their data and roughly in 10 minutes, they will have the images, they will have the molecule, molecules which were in the data back. And there is a lot of computing. There is pretty interesting and complicated uh, computation going on here on the cloud. And, um, and, but what we also started doing from the beginning, we asked a lot of people, are you okay to share your results public? And many people said yes. And then we'll say, yes, great. So we'll put it into a metabolite imaging knowledge base, which will accumulate results from the whole world. And it's working actually pretty well. So by now we, we have processed more than 8,000 submissions over the past roughly two years. Um, it's, it's growing very fast. So there are more than 100 labs using it. And what's really cool, and what I'm very happy and proud about that, just in two, uh, the last two years, there were more than 30 publications using this using this engine, using this platform uh, for their research. And behind it, there is uh, definitely scientists, but there is also a team of free software developers really working uh, hard to make all this you know, process, to improve in computation of our, to really coming up with new features and new, new methods, and new ways to interpret the data. So um, this is our major um, platform. If you're interested, go to metaspace2020.eu. And you'll, you'll find a lot of uh, information there. You can go to publications. You can go to other, other sections of the website to learn more about this. There is also um, like tutorials and all these things. So um, now with, this, with the power of this platform, we can actually answer the questions, what kind of molecules can we detect, for example, from that uh, the, uh, mouse brain section? And now we know that some molecules are actually super easy to detect. And for example, glutaminolysis, a very important pathway in cancer, and actually being more and more recognized uh, for its importance, super easy to detect. Some other molecules, amino acids as well, uh, small lipids, big lipids also. So here I put uh, some names of molecules, which actually kind of like, you know, sweet spot for, for the technology. So, but some molecules, for example, here, glycolysis and DCA, although we're able to detect them, it's actually really hard to detect many or all of them, those which are necessary. So that means, for example, for if you are thinking about glycolysis or TPA, maybe you, you, you shall go to another spatial omics and look into spatial transcriptomics, or maybe even think about other approaches uh, uh, for, for this. So uh, next, I would like to show you uh, um, how actually it looks, how the what 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 this website or what this or a cloud platform provides. And here I'll go through yeah, cloud works. So we'll go to Metaspace 2020. Now it looks a bit better, a bit newer. So we'll go to a set of um, data sets which were uh, contributed to us and also to a whole community. It's public data sets by two pharma companies, Servier from France and uh, Genentech from, from the US. We'll pick one data set that shows a mouse whole body section. You know, here it would be brain, here it would be a scale, internal organs. And what we have now, the ability, because data is already processed, so we can now click through all these molecules which were detected and just with a, just one click and uh, we can get a localization of this particular molecule on next molecule. For example, here we see it's creatine and now we can look where the localization is and overlay it with a, with a uh, optical image already provided uh, uh, by, the, by the data owners and associated with organs and so on and so forth. And once again, uh, this is definitely a very beautiful data set, but overall we have more than 
8,000 data sets in this um, metaspace knowledge base, and uh, more than 50% of them are public. So this is really a huge resource uh, for mining. And this is how we started using it. Okay. So because we started not only using this as just big database of molecule tissue section, but we started actually developing, uh, developing methods ourselves, but we also started attracting others. And, um, and because we said, okay, look, we have this engine and um, you put data in, you get molecules out, many people make it public. So we have really a, a loyal community of users. And again, it's all for free and because it's all funded by third party funding. So, and let's now expert, engage experts. Let's suppose that we, we want to solve a particular problem. So what we do, we go back to the users and we say, you know, guys, we need your help. We need your, what the great gold standard data, which will be used or ground truth data, which will be used for machine learning. And this is really the key. If, you, if you're interested in this topic, I would suggest you to read the review, which I recently published, because they are really stressed the importance of the ground truth data, because this is really the, the, the bottleneck in, apply, in developing machine learning methods for spatial omics and other omics in general. So, and here, how, again, how we overcome this challenge, we go back to the users, we say, you know, we need your help. So you need now to click through several thousands of images, but if everyone does it, so then afterwards we'll come up with a method which will reproduce this routine work that you do. And we applied it already to, for, for a few problems. I'll not go into details here. The publications uh, are, are here listed. But basically we engage the experts, we create the ground truth, we put in the machine learning. This is actually relatively easy right now. So once we have the really high quality ground truth data, train and evaluate and find the best algorithm, relatively simple. And then we put it back into the engine and now everyone can use it, everyone is happy. And this, is, this creates a really nice circle that where we show example, we improve uh, uh, the engine, we provide more functionality. And now we have at least one publication coming up very soon, already now it's preparing, where others actually do the same. They reach to us and they're like, you know, we have idea, but we don't have enough data. And we're like, okay, we'll work with you. So, and we, we select data for them. They actually develop the method and now we'll be implementing it in other space. So again, it will be uh, re, re kind of enforcing the, the capacities even further. So with this, I'd like to wrap up the first part of my talk. So I'd like to uh, uh, highlight that um, metabolism is becoming uh, uh, more and more important uh, for understanding of homeostasis, but also disease. So, and metabolomics for a lot of uh, its properties, in particular, degradation, dynamics, and uh, this heterogeneity, but also microenvironment really uh, demands to be done in situ and on the single cell level. So uh, imaging mass spectrometry, the technology that I have presented, um, it, is, it became the major technology for spatial metabolomics. It can do, can detect, quantify, metabolize lipids, in, mainly in cryo sections. And then spatial resolution is it, already by now, it's five micrometer, and it's proven at least twice, roughly, every year. So, and, uh, and, and lots of metaspace, the platform, the engine, but also the platform we created, can be a really useful resource even for those who, who don't use imaging mass spectrometry because it provides a lot of public data. With this, I'd like to move on to the second part of my talk and present the results that we've developed for uh, uh, methods for single cell metabolomics. Before I go there, I would like to, to highlight that single cell metabolomics, although definitely much less known compared to other single cell omics, in particular RNA-seq, it's actually a pretty, it's, it's very small, but it's very fast developing field. And uh, maybe 10 years ago, there were just like three labs in the world doing it. But by now, I recently tried to count and there's definitely not extensive leads, but there are roughly 20, 20 labs uh, developing methods or trying to develop methods for, for this emerging field. So in many of them, they, they're based on microsampling where you try to stock a, a very minute amount of material from as cell, and afterwards do a super highly sensitive mass spectrometry to detect the molecule. Very challenging, but also very low throughput. Um, multi image mass spectrometry is becoming a, a key technology, and I'll, I'll show why. But there are also some other approaches. But um, among the current limitations of the methods existing, and this was also the state of the art when we started looking into this field, was first of all low throughput not only in terms of number of cells, but also in terms of number of samples. 
on some methods need uh, uh, they need um, isolating this material from a cell which is really micro suction very very low throughput very 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 complex procedure and uh, many of them they need some custom mass spectrometer setup which is not available so we have developed methods with uh, what we had back then with a technology which is commercial multi image mass spectrometry so how do you how do we do it so the method that we developed called uh, we call it space m so uh, we take the cells uh, and it can work for adherent cells, but also now we have methods for cells in suspension. Uh, we put them on a glass slide, then we fix them, then we, uh, we do microscopy to find where the cells are, their phenotype, their relationships, and, um, and other properties. Then we put the same cells into imaging mass spectrometer and we use MALDI, this laser-based uh, 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 technology for this. And uh, it creates this sort of images. We put the data through metaspace to find molecules. This was absolutely crucial step for us because otherwise the spectra are so complex and in particular on a single cell level, they are so noisy, it's really hard to make sense out of it. But once we put them through this engine, we get say a hundred or a few hundred molecules that are very relevant, biologically relevant. And then Luca Rapes, who um, uh, uh, was a PhD student in our team, he developed a very clever approach how to overlay this sort of data, model imaging, and this sort of data from microscopy. And if you're interested in the details in this spectrum. And once we can do this and we can normalize and associate the, the pixels with individual cells, then we can actually get single cell molecular or metabolite images, where for every metabolite, we are getting an image where every cell here is color coded according to intensities, relative intensity of this metabolite. So long story short, what we're getting is what we call spatial molecular matrix, where for every cell we can go back and in silico pool uh, intensity of, of metabolites, fluorescence intensities in different channels, morphological properties, area, size, elongation of the cell, and so on. And also spatial features, which, which cells are next to each other. The technology is relatively high throughput. Right now it can uh, detect uh, at least a thousand cells per hour. So it can also do um, multiplexing up to 10 samples. And we are working definitely on scaling up. And it can also detect uh, more than 100 molecules uh, from every cell. And actually very similar profiles that we're getting from tissues. So here I'd like to show um, one method that uh, I'm pretty proud um, uh, that our another PhD student, Sergio, developed. And this method was inspired by the validation approaches in single cell rna seq so here we wanted to validate the method and to really show that, yes, it works on a single cell level. So what Sergio came up with, so he co-cultured two cell types, one human cell, uh, cell type and another mouse, um, both cell lines, and each of them are expressing fluorescent proteins, so red and green. So here you see a really heterogeneous, spatially heterogeneous mixture of two cell types, and we put this as a ground truth into uh, uh, our space and method, and this is what space and found. So it could really uh, reconstruct the, the cell type with a pretty high accuracy, above uh, 90%. So, and here you see that the, the cells which are monocultured, they're actually very easy to, uh, to tell them apart. The cells which are co-cultured, a bit more, more hard. And uh, so it potentially indicates the metabolic intermixing between the cells upon co-culture. And further, uh, we have observed this effect of really kind of exchange, you know, of metabolites uh, for, for macrophages, which is pretty well known because macrophages, they actually ingest uh, uh, other cells. And uh, so by this, they actually obtaining so some, some metabolites coming from other cells. So, um, but it was interesting that here we observed that uh, potentially the same effect also for uh, cell types, which are not associated with uh, any sort of you know, ingestion. So, um, yeah, then we moved on, and I would like to show you one application of this method that we have performed together with Matthias Heitenwelder from German Cancer Research. Uh, here you see his review, uh, a screenshot from there. So where it shows um, the focal point of this study as well, namely the transition of cells from the healthy liver towards the autotic liver, then local inflammation, which goes into a um, very inflammatory state and uh, of the disease called NASH, non-alcoholic steatic hepatitis, which is the key factor for transition further into fibrosis in particular for hepatocellular carcinoma. So very important problem, also disease which is becoming younger and younger, and there is still no cure 
uh, a lot of um, drug candidates in the, in the trials, but uh, still a lot of questions not answered. So um, uh, our collaborators, they have a, a, a perfect model, a in vitro model for, for this disease, which is hepatocytes, which are called cultures with fatty acids, and incubated with a different cytokines. Here, for example, CNF alpha, so which induces uh, inflammation. And here, what you can appreciate if you, uh, if I show you images of cells uh, used for for for, uh, for the nuclei, but and and yellow here, and these are lipid droplets accumulated, you know, conglomerates of lipids inside the cells. First of all, you can appreciate that yes, they actually they they are like really accumulating a lot of lipids inside. They go into this ballooning state of uh, uh, steatosis, but on top of this, you see the high heterogeneity even in this. Um, uh, um, even among the cell lines. So there is definitely a lot of cell to cell coordinate going on here. So um, next, what we have considered, uh, we have considered, uh, okay, so how much time do I have? Okay, I have five minutes, good. So first we're like, okay, so look, we have the cells, which they seem to accumulate lipid droplets. They, they, they seem like they react to, to stimulation. Let's put them into uh, space M and let's, let's figure out what makes them different on the metabolic level. So we did uh, space M, we found uh, several hundreds of metabolic and lipids per cell. Then we put it into your map and what we saw, we saw a, a very distinct uh, subpopulation of cells. Again, this is an isogenic cell line. So um, distinct subpopulation of cells and we can find markers of this. For example, here, a particular lipid, which has high intensity here. Here, another lipid, uh, high intensity here. What's very interesting, that this is uh, not exactly the information that you can get with just uh, this sort of thing, which unspecifically shows your accumulation of lipids. So this, uh, this thing is, is, again, it's unspecific. It shows like some lipids go up, some lipids go down. And what we see here is that in this population, yes, majority of cells, they have a lot of lipids, but there are also cells with a, uh, not that many lipids, but they have high values of the markers. So that means we really have much more specificity in defining the uh, uh, biologically relevant phenotype. So now we can call this particular cell, in this particular say, area of UMAP, we can call them, say, uh, cells being in the theatotic state. And we validated the markers. I'll go a bit quicker here. So we validated the markers to be able to say that, yes, this is the theatotic state, because the markers that we found here, which are upregulated in the, in the cells and the state, they are actually were reported earlier associated with this a patient disease, uh, disease state called status. Okay, now I get into the final piece of the results. And uh, namely, I would like to show you the results of analysis of different simulations. And here we have control cells, we have cells with just fatty acids, which is in vitro model for a fatty liver disease. On top of this here, we added a cytokine, which is model of NASH, and that's what we did we actually added anti-inflammatory treatment to them, which inhibits inflammation and hopefully actually basically almost get cures to cells. But let, let, let's have a look whether it really does. So uh, here I'm showing you are, um, a single cell plot. It's not exactly you map, but something very similar, um, where one dot is one cell based on these hundreds of metabolites and lipids color coded by the condition, control cells. This would be the cells, say our fatty liver disease model. This is our, say, NASH model. And what we can already appreciate here is that after we apply this anti-inflammatory treatment, the cells don't go back to the, to the homeostatic state. They actually, they, hang, they kind of get pushed away, indeed. They have away from inflammatory state with very high uh, percentage of response, but they're still uh, residing closest to this fatty liver disease state, which is very interesting. We now also find the trajectory similar to uh, uh, other single cell analysis done in uh, uh, other fields. And now what we can do, we can actually plot, we can do the uh, clustering, find the, the cluster, say control, or hemostatic, steatotic, intermediate, and let's now have a look at the markers. So here I'm showing you selected markers which are plotted along this trajectory, which was automatically found from the control to the most steatotic cells. And now we can see that, I mean, first of all, there are the markers for the normal state. There are markers importantly for the steatotic state. And now if we look actually, can we validate it? 
can we really say that they have something to do with that analysis or even with Nash? So we consider the a mouse model. And here we, uh, we put a mouse on a Western diet, uh, which is considered early model of Nash. And now we'll be plotting the intensities of these markers. For a single cell data, one pixel here would one cell. And for the bulk data, you really see how well uh, the, the results from the bulk uh, animal model are represented in our cell data, which is really exciting. And on top of this, a bunch of markers that we found, they were reported as markers of Nash or statosis in patients. And this is really, really cool because it shows actually the potential of using in vitro single cell analysis metabolomics for finding something which has, in terms of markers, has very high correlation with the markers found in, 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 in patients. This is really cool. Uh, this, uh, I, was, I was very excited about this. So I'll skip the, the last slide which I had. I'll go back to the summary. And uh, I would like to, uh, to, uh, uh, to summarize it with a, with a statement that single, they, there's a spatial omics revolution is happening. The single cell revolution is also happening, so, and we should not forget it. And those methods which can actually integrate both spatial analysis and single cell analysis, they probably will be uh, uh, in very high demand. What I've shown you today, I've shown you actually two different branches, right? So I've shown you spatial metabolomics with multi imaging and single cell metabolomics for cell cultures. Can we do, can we merge them? So not yet. It's, it's kind of really challenging to find individual cells on this spatial resolution, but definitely with an increase of the, uh, uh, spatial resolution of image mass spectrometry and multi imaging, this will be possible and we are closely looking into it. So um, then I've shown you SpaceM, which is uh, our method for spatial, in particular, in the cell metabolomics of cell cultures. It has a lot of, it, it, a lot of um, uh, very good properties, high throughput, cheap. I mean, it's Compared to other omics, just to get you a ballpark figure, it's something like 1,000 times cheaper than single cell or anisic. And uh, compared to, say, spatial omics, it's also probably 1,000 times cheaper than, say, Visium from, from 10x um, for spatial transcriptomics. So it's actually really cheap technology. So at the same time, very powerful, providing very inform uh, informative free data. So, and uh, SpaceM, we can already say with confidence that it's discriminating cell types, but what's even more important, it can help to discover and characterize the metabolic cell states, given isogenic cell populations, but definitely getting much more interesting when you start perturbing them, either as we've shown with, a, uh, with a, say, cytokines or with a drugs or drug candidates. Uh, and uh, what's important is that we really have the hope that it, it will provide the link between phenotype and metabolism, not only in a few case studies that we've performed, but also much, uh, in much more broader context. With this, I would like to wrap up. I would like to uh, uh, thank the whole team who contributed to, uh, to this work. Uh, Luca Rapes uh, has developed uh, the single cell metabolomics method. He was a PhD in our team. And um, now um, he, he did a short postdoc. He's actually currently looking for for the for the next postdoc. So if you if you're interested, um, please let me know. And uh, I think you will be very uh, very interested to consider the spatial omics uh, labs for for his postdoc. But also a lot of other people who contributed here: computer scientists, again, uh, chemists, mass spectrometrists, biologists, and software developers. Uh, past members who contributed, our collaborators at Tembo, uh, who contributed to this particular work, our collaborators from German Cancer Research um, on Single Cell Project, a lot of other collaborators who helped or inspired us, and definitely uh, the funding agencies who, who are funding all this work. And thank you very much for, for organizing this, this seminar and uh, definitely for, for your attendance. And with this, um, I am wrapping up and I'll be very happy to answer questions if there is time and if there are any questions. Yeah, uh, this is an impressive talk. Uh, I think uh, probably, I see four questions in the chat box. Uh, I can, I can read for you. Uh, I think the first is about the, where is the meta space hosted and what is the cost associated with maintaining this, uh, this uh, system? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, Middle Space, once again, this is open source platform. So um, basically anyone can get it from GitHub and um, deploy it wherever you, they want. It's, however, a pretty complicated cloud uh, uh, software. So uh, a lot of people who try it, they actually prefer using, using our system. So uh, where we host it, we host it currently on AWS or Amazon Cloud. Uh, because it provides actually a really nice cutting edge technologies at the same time has a lot of options to make it cheap or well cheaper say then um, we're currently working with a IBM research um, in one European funded project to really develop the next say generation of computing for middle space and we are looking together with IBM to move the, the engine and the say the most intensive uh, computing parts to IBM cloud because they provide some special technology, which is actually not available currently on Amazon, on AWS. Um, this is concerning the technology. In terms of costs, um, the main costs are, um, definitely there is cost for computing. So in terms of the cloud cost, this is the biggest one. Storage is currently very cheap um, because, you know, compared to many other storage, like demands, um, spatial armings, it, they generate terabytes of data for sure, uh, but it's still, it, it's, it's relatively small. And we, we definitely optimize it. We, we store on the cheaper options, only things which are necessary and more expensive ones. And, um, but in, yeah, this is computing there is the biggest part for cloud, but you know, it's, it's no comparison compared to uh, the software developers costs. So really the, the cost for to hire the developers. And currently we have three people. So this is probably seems like almost three times the the personnel cost is uh, not three ten times more than all computing costs uh, altogether. So at least ten times. Um, so this is definitely the the biggest investment. And uh, but like we are lucky that the platform is very well used. There is a good community, and uh, we are lucky to get grants kind of supported by by you know probably reviews and uh, uh, responses from the community. Uh, I see there's another question from uh, Smovedi uh, Parik. Uh, I think the question is, how does one confirm that the metabolic intermixing you observe in uh, co-cultures uh, is not uh, rising as a result of the cell permeability caused by matrix application? Yeah. So, yes. Um, yeah, when we've seen this, we actually uh, were raised to ourselves, we ask ourselves a lot of questions, in particular this one. So, because indeed, I mean, when you're detecting something which is shared by two cells which are next to each other, whether, uh, whether this is the, the product of really these two cells, like sharing molecular signatures, or whether it's just uh, the poor resolution of your technology, I and mean, it can be both, right? You can, and uh, this, this aspect, which was raised by using so-called multi-metrics, which can actually cause delocalization of molecules and kind of like basically like spread the metabolites across the cells so that they will leak out, they will be a little bit delocalized. This is just one actually um, uh, uh, reason how metabolites can be delocalized. So, um, and we looked into this. Another one, for example, can be the laser focus. If they say the laser focus that we use is, is too big, it's bigger than the size of the cell, then we'll be sampling more than one cell. And then definitely we'll see basically like cells sharing properties according to our detection. So we looked into this. I'll not go right now into all details because we studied it very comprehensively and we have a lot of uh, uh, results in the preprint to address specifically this question. So um, probably the most interesting method that we've developed there is to really, if I want to say whether this molecule is say inside the cell or is delocalized, what I expect, the molecules which are delocalized will be detected outside of the cell. And you know, since I can really understand, uh, I can uh, uh, um, understand very well whether my laser hit the cell or no cell, then molecules which are coming from the uh, laser spots which are no cell, then I should actually not consider that, I should skip that. And moreover, we kind of detect the profile, you know, of, of leakage of the metabolites outside of the cell. It's not really black and white. So some metabolites, they leak, they really produce basically like, you know, this kind of blur outside of the cells. 
some don't, and this is specific to a chemical properties, but some, something else that we don't understand. So basically, um, we, uh, we studied this, we quantified it, we removed all the molecules which potentially can, um, can be leaked. We, we took only those which are super highly intracellular, and we still have so this effect. And again, this was just one way how we addressed it. And I would, I would uh, uh, ask you to, uh, to have a look at the preprint or drop me a line if you're interested to learn more. Yeah, I think uh, on the audience, if you want to ask a question, you can also unmute yourself, I believe you are able to, and, uh, and go ahead and ask. I could have one, I maybe ask one question. So, you know, the, in the peaks, you could also identify uh, the protein fragments, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, amino acids and others. Um, how could you kind of use maybe this one for also protein, partially pre fragmentation, right? Protein map mapping. That's one question. The second question will be, how are you gonna maybe possibly understand the fragmentation differences from one user to another when you line up the state in the cloud, right? And um, that's the second question. And third one, the when you use the MALDI, right? And can you correlate it to the MESPEC exact peaks and do an inter, you know, kind of pipeline where you do interchangeable analysis, right? For the same sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I I'll, I'll try to answer all of them. But if I if I if something will be not clear, please ask me. So I think the most interesting what we found is that so now with uh, having all this public data, we're able to go back and uh, and if we have any question, you know, previously we would need to collect the data and then maybe still would this will be a fact of only our imaging mass spectrometer, right? Will be trapped in this, will be studied too much. Now, if we have some hypothesis, if we have some questions, for example, you, you said, oh, maybe this is something which is, I don't know, protein fragment, or fragment maybe of some other molecule, or there is this aspect, which is, uh, uh, which, which they think, which is called multi matrix, which, you know, it's very specific protocol. In every protocol, you add this matrix on top of the tissue, and it kind of helps you to detect molecules, but at the same time, it actually produces some artifacts in your spectrum. So, and now, for example, if we have hypothesis that, you know, oh, maybe this molecule is not really molecule biological one, but it's something coming from metrics or another artifacts, protein fragments, as you said, anything. Now we can go back to, uh, to all this data and we can search and see whether it's associated with a particular metadata. And this metadata can be technology, can be lab, can be anything. And by this, we are learning like so much and so far and we're getting rid of the molecules that we think, no, this is actually happening everywhere. Or it's, for example, we detect it in the brain and it's associated with the brain. So, you know, so, and what's interesting, one technology where, again, it, there is a preprint, I didn't cite it here because it was just out like a few days ago, where collaborators, they wanted to improve data. You know, there, in mass spectrometry, there is this thing that peaks are not exact. So you need to, uh, to do so-called recalibration, kind of like shift them, very, very exact. So, and, um, and this is, this is a huge issue. It's a very boring issue, but huge issue. So, and, uh, and what they did, they're like, okay, so in order to, to find how to actually shift the, right, the peaks, I'll take my data set, I'll go to meta space, I'll pull data sets which have the same metadata, and I'll take those average as kind of templates how I need to shift my peaks, you know, find the molecules which are the most abundant, da, da, da. and now they do this and they show that uh, afterwards, they improve the quality of the data. They put it back in middle space, they get five to 10 times more molecules detected with high confidence, which is, you know, mind blowing. It's basically just an algorithm. And now we will be implementing in middle space and running through the whole historic data. So in historic data, there will be more molecules detected. But now everyone who will submit will have this option. So, and again, this is just one example of how like the historic data can help to answer a lot of technical questions here. The question concerning proteins is definitely very, very interesting. Right now, we are focusing on metabolites, small molecules, lipids, but there is a lot of uh, interest, not only in proteins, but also other classes, for example, glycans, you know? And I mean, probably, you know, spatial glycomics, it will take a while before it will really arrive as a field. But definitely, there is a lot of interest in glycans because they, 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 they have a lot of roles in cancer. They also, they serve as signaling molecules. But they serve also as molecules of the rose, which actually no one even knows at this point. 
So and uh, so when we are looking into into this, and maybe next will be peptides, you know, and this may be peptides like small, like neuropeptides, but maybe like with brainstorming with also with collaborators, how we can actually help them with the middle space to develop some methods that will be detecting peptides after a trypsin digestion to do really like bottom up spatial proteomics. So there is definitely a lot of things going on there. So I personally don't have any results to show yet, but uh, we're trying to definitely to support su such, uh, such um, efforts with a, here, not with historic data, but here with really algorithms with capacity, computing capacity and so on. Thank you. Yeah, Veldo, I think you alluded a little bit uh, in the beginning, so uh, sort of how your invasion this uh, might be uh, uh, useful in a kind of translational clinical kind of, uh, so uh, can you kind of further elaborate on this and uh, or maybe one or two specific exam examples? Um, so you think how the spatial uh, metabolomics or spatial maybe multi-omics uh, can find application uh, in either preclinical drug discovery or uh, clinical uh, sample analysis. Yeah, yeah, there are definitely a lot of interest there, and there are a few success stories already. So, so multi imaging uh, was uh, is already an established method for uh, DMPK or drug pharmacokinetics and metabolism in uh, in pharma. So basically, as far as I know, almost all top 10 pharma already either have the labs to run uh, multi imaging or setting up the labs or working with CR CROs, uh, service providers, to really use it for what? To really understand where does the drug go, where it gets accumulated, and also whether it's metabolized or not metabolized. So, because it's actually pretty unique technology where you can detect the drug, but you can also, in the same shot, detect drug metabolites. You don't need to label it, it's very fast, it's relatively cheap. And, um, and, and this is, it's now, it's now already bread and butter. So and there are efforts to really uh, get approval from FDA, it will definitely take a lot of time to, so that this will be used as FDA approved technology instead of some older technology which was for this purpose. But then definitely the next step will be, okay, what about metabolism, right? So can we actually use this technology to understand metabolism? And this one, I think it's, it's, it's still research going on. There is no, no success stories that, you know, like other than few, not few, but publications, there is no big pipelines yet. So, but what's definitely like one of the biggest fields, um, which is currently under development is digital pathology. Because um, there is a lot of promise that spatial metabolomics can detect informative profiles that would be um, uh, 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 predictive for the cancer state of the cell, right? And to, for example, discriminate cells from a normal to say cancer, but also grades of cancer or types of normal tissue. And, uh, and this will be done uh, more specific or m more accurate than digital like examination. You can train a lot of machine learning methods because it's very high dimensional information reach without. And, uh, and there is kind of no potential that this will be working better than just uh, algorithms or AI trained on just pathological images, because it represents not only say how the cell looks, but also what's going on in, in the cell, but or what started going on inside the cell. And uh, this is this is a big field in imaging aspect. There is also a lot of interest there in AI machine learning methods. What's going on there? So in terms of drug discovery, this is definitely a very interesting aspect because there is a lot of animal models and uh, which are used for this. And this is right now what is being used mainly in pharma. Um, so there is definitely a lot of interest. Where I see a lot of interest is also to use it in at the very early stage of uh, development for in vitro systems. And the, this method that I, I've, I've, I've shown you, uh, space M for a single cell metabolomics. Even, even excluding the spatial aspects, which we're still very interested, we're still searching, you know, like for a really convincing story because the cells, I mean, I've shown just single cell results, but you know, I mean, we really see that the cells, they really communicate to each other and we see some spatial effects. We just, we were not able to really get really striking convincing story in terms of linking edge biology. But it's very well known, some cells, they, first of all, they need particular density, they need actual partners, 
And then also we know that the cells just, you know, they form aggregates of different cell types in organoids. So there is definitely a lot of aspects in the uh, spatial omics, even in in vitro models. And this is what I'm very interested in because uh, if we would find a way, and we're working on this, uh, to push the technology into a very early stages of drug discovery as very informative readouts, and also keep in mind this is very cheap readouts, very cheap and very fast compared to many other omics. So um, again, thousands times, thousand times cheaper than RNA seq, and also much faster. So if we can do this, then uh, um, then we will be able to actually like get this readout, use it for at the very early stage with the promise that this would provide this, you know, the, the closest to phenotype layer of omics compared to others. And, um, but this is, at this point, it's mainly development, lots going on, and uh, definitely a uh, um, very interesting field to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exciting. It's very insightful and also educational, I think, for the audience. And, so I, I remember, I think my computational biology friends constantly talk about cancer cells may behave like some bacteria. They have no Warburger effect. I think, I think your system is really perfect to, to examine that theory. Yeah. And I think what's, what's cool concerning Warburger effect that, you know, so Warburger effect is now uh, being recognized and uh, uh, in many cell types, not only in cancer cell types, and some of them, that they are adaptations to uh, the specific conditions inside tumors, like for example, the reprogramming of T cells, you know, when they activate, they, they, they reprogram from say slow metabolism, the fatty acid metabolism towards the fast glycolysis. And, but there is also, uh, uh, it, it's also been found in other cell types. So it, it's very interesting. So what, what can be discovered with a, with, a, with a single cell and a spatial metabolomics but, and I think it, it's, now, it's now the time when, when there, there will be more and more of these applications coming up because, again, as 2011, so metabolomics transition from the cataloging of chemical structures to finding biological stories, the same right now, like nine years later. I think this is about the time when it's very similar situation in spatial metabolomics, where it was mainly technology development, um, methods, algorithms, experimental computation, but now there are, there, are, there are pipelines, there are tools, there are commercial platforms. And uh, a lot of biologists that start applying this, I'm pretty sure there will be more, more results coming up and also more potential also for industry and uh, startups uh, on top of this coming up also in the next, the next years. Yeah, thank you, Theodor, for this amazing talk. Uh, so I would like to turn this to Ahmed if uh, you're still online. Uh, in case uh, anything you want to announce for the next week, uh, he just he he just messaged me that he had to go for for the next uh, meeting. So I think okay. he, he's away. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Uh, so I think we we do have a seminar next week, and uh, I hope people can uh, uh, kind of dial back in next Friday and uh, for all the friends uh, attending from Europe, I think I hope that this becomes your kind of every week hobby during a Friday evening. <laughs> and so, Friday uh, happy hour. Yeah, Friday happy hour for European friends. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to seeing you again next Friday. Cool, cheers everyone. Thank, mm -hmm. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.